quantum mechanics shows that our universe has the strange property of being non-local, but current experiments leave a significant loophole. This video discusses non-locality and it shows how the loophole can be closed in the very near future. Our first task is to define non-locality, but it's best to begin with the definition of locality. Our universe is local if and only if procedures carried out in any region A do not immediately disturb any sufficiently distant region B in any significant way. We don't care about minor disturbances. These are disturbances that are so small that they don't cause any change to the results of any experiment. For example, at least according to Newtonian mechanics, by jiggling my arm, I can instantly cause the moon to jiggle in its orbit. But this is completely unmeasurable. It's too, far too small. Nowadays, in the time of uh, relativity, sufficiently distant means essentially space-like separated. You can't get a, a ray of light to travel between the two places. Non-locality is the opposite of this. Our universe is non-local if and only if some procedures carried out in region A immediately cause changes in the results of experiments in arbitrarily distant region B. Einstein, together with Podolsky and Rosen, first considered, but re rejected, the possibility that the universe might be non-local. Before them, everyone believed the universe to be local. This is hardly surprising. Suppose you were doing an experiment in region B. Your results could be totally disrupted, one would think, by goings on in region A, and there are many such regions A. We next come to controversy over non-locality. If it's correct, quantum mechanics proves that our cosmos is non-local. In a moment, I'll give a lucid proof by Travis Norson. Some experts argue that current experiments do not prove non-locality. They claim that a genuine measurement can only be made by a conscious witness. But in all experiments to date, the witnesses at A and B are merely recording devices. It's only later that results are compared by human witnesses at a single location. I'll propose experiments with human witnesses at A and B. We're close to having the technology to be able to perform such experiments. There's no credible doubt that quantum mechanics will be upheld. And the qualms of the doubters will be dispelled. Here is Travis Norson's Proof of Non-Locality, uh, taken from his book, Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. In his words, Bell's theorem then, taken here to mean the proof that local hidden variable theories are wrong, must be understood as the second part of an overall two-part argument, the first part of which is the EPR argument. Schematically, the two-part argument goes like this. The EPR theorem says that locality implies X. And Bell's theorem says that X implies conflict with experiment. Travis continues, here X stands for something like 
local deterministic hidden variables, but somehow the logic is easier to grasp by suppressing this. Obviously, if X implies conflict with experiment, then X must be false, which means we cannot maintain locality because locality entails X. Here is David Merman's very simple bell type experiment. Entangled particles A and B leave the source and arrive at space-like separated regions big A and big B. At each trial, the experimenters are free to orient their instruments in directions K, L or M, and they do this independently of one another. Quantum mechanics predicts that when the settings are the same, say both K, then the results will always disagree. But when the settings differ, say the setting at A is K and the setting at B is L, then the results agree on 75% of the trials. Assuming locality, when the settings are the same, the results always disagree as before. But when settings differ, results can agree by at most 67%. This is Bell's theorem. But the quantum mechanic result is what is actually seen experimentally. But there's a loophole. There have been no human observers actually at locations A and B in any experiment to date. We're only decades away from being able to send astronauts to Mars. Earth and Mars can be regarded as being at regions A and B, with scientists at these locations performing the measurements. An automatic spacecraft orbiting close to Lagrange point L4 acts as a source of pairs of laser pulses entangled in polarization. L4 forms an equilateral triangle with the Earth and Sun. And the Earth-Sun distance is 8.3 light minutes, so the scientists have minutes to carry out their observations. All calculations are approximate because I'm taking the orbit of Mars to be circular, whereas it is notably elliptical. With this assumption, L4 is about midway between the Earth and Mars when theta is about 100 degrees. We use a coordinate system in which the Sun, Earth and L4 are fixed. In this system, Mars is moving clockwise by about 1.1 degrees per day, so theta is decreasing. This is because in reality, Earth is overtaking Mars in its orbit. We can extend the experiment by performing it over a large portion of Mars's orbit, shown here from C to B. At C, Mars is in conjunction with, in the same direction as, the Sun. And here Mars is much further from L4 than the Earth is. As a result, the observation is made later on Mars than on Earth. Similar remarks apply for positions of Mars intermediate between C and B. Moreover, we have to calculate the straight line Mars-Earth distance for each value of theta. Here I've made some rough calculations. Mars is in opposition when it's exactly in the opposite direction from the Sun as seen from the Earth. And this happens when theta equals zero degrees. The first two columns give theta varying from 180 to 100 degrees and also the days before opposition. The next two columns give the Mars L4 distance and the Mars Earth distance in light minutes. 
and of course the Earth L4 distance is always a constant. Delta T gives the difference in time between when observations were made on Earth and when they were made on Mars. For example, at B, when Mars is at B, the distance is very close to zero. But when Mars is in conjunction at C, the distance is 10 minutes. We have to subtract the delta T from the Mars Earth distance in light minutes to give the effective Mars Earth distance in light minutes. And that's the final column. As you can see, Earth and Mars are always well separated, being between 16 and 11 light minutes apart. What do the experimenters on Mars and on the Earth have to do? What do the experimenters have to do? First, they have to choose an orientation, KLRM, for their measuring device, and they can do this any way they like. They could spin a spinner, or express pi in base three and use the digits of pi to give the orientation. Or they could just choose a direction at whim. Or they could select some genuinely random method, such as radioactive decay, to give their figure. Their next task is to turn their device into the selected orientation. Then they have to wait for the experimental result. This will be either up or down, and it might be displayed as the appropriate word lit up on a panel. Finally, they have to note down the experimental result. And they could just do this by noting it in pencil and paper in their logbook. And they would have to repeat this for many trials. I would estimate that the time the experimenters needed to complete these four steps would be less than two minutes. And this is far less than the 10 minutes or 10 light minutes that Mars and Earth are separated by. This means that the experimenters at A and B are space-like separated. What conclusions can we draw from all this? There can be no credible doubt that the experimental results will be as quantum mechanics predicts. And there can be absolutely no doubt that the experimental records at A and B give an accurate and reliable account of commonplace events. Indeed, we may imagine that these events are witnessed by reliable witnesses at each location. It's just the fact that breaking of Bell's inequality does not depend on quantum mechanics being true. But this breaking does show, based on the recorded evidence, that the universe is indeed non-local. Attempts to save locality, such as so-called superdeterminism, have very great difficulties. In conclusion, our universe is non-local. Non-locality is perfectly benign and it is consistent with both special and general relativity. That's all, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video.